Hi, welcome to Rich in Relationship, and today we're interviewing Catherine Miller, who's the founder of the Miller Law Group and director at the Center for Understanding and Conflict. And she's basically a thought leader in the world of collaborative law and mediation, and that's why I've invited her to be on the show today. How are you doing, Catherine? I'm great, Rich. It's a pleasure to be here. Wow, you never call me Rich. This is a whole new experience. Well, I can see that we're at Rich in Relationship. Awesome. Awesome. So. What inspired you to get involved in the world of collaborative law and mediation? Well, it's a long story. When I was in law school, I was really interested in justice, and I figured out in the, uh, in the orientation week that that's not what law school was going to be about, and so I quickly switched my focus to families. So I come from a family of psychologists, and I, I was always interested in people. So I focused my law school career on family law, and that's what I started to do right out of law school. And after a couple of years, I realized that, in fact, the law in the courtroom is a really bad place for families. And I took a mediation training, and I tried to integrate some of those mediative ideas of settling my divorce cases based on what was important to the people rather than what was important to the to the lawyers or to the judge. And in every single case, I ran into the same problem, and that problem was the other lawyer. So fast forward about 10 years, and I was getting divorced myself, and I realized that what I suspected all along, that this was a horrible, disruptive, um, painful, and hijacking process for my clients was true when I sat in the client chair. So after that experience, I decided I couldn't do that anymore, and I quit my job, and I looked around for other things to do. And after I took another mediation training and I did a little mediation, I did a little this, a little that, and then I uh, took a collaborative training. And within 15 minutes, it felt like coming home. I thought, well, this is what I was always trying to do all those 10 years <clears throat> of bringing in these mediative ideas of focusing on what's important to the people rather than what's important under the law or to judges or to lawyers. Uh, and that's how we would settle the case in, in a conference room, not a courtroom based on what was important to uh, the people involved. And I actually had a new client who'd come in a couple of weeks prior to my taking the collaborative training, and his wife didn't even know they were getting divorced yet, and I literally called him from the train you know, on the phone. I'm like, hey, Gene, let's do this collaborative thing. And he said, okay, what did he know? In hindsight, what did I know? But that's how I got involved in it, and I think it really is really an important thing to focus on families and focus on people rather than focus on um, legal arguments and traditional strategic mm -hmm. negotiation. Got it. And um, as a trained mediator, who in fact you have trained, my understanding is that the mediation process doesn't necessarily have a specific end in goal. Uh, and that, well, meaning the, 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 the specific end would be understanding. And that sometimes when you're engaging in mediation, people even find that maybe they're not so keen on actually getting divorced at times. Yeah, I mean, I think mediators look at this in a different way. The way that I look at it in the years that I've been doing it is that each day when the couple comes in, they are maybe in a different place. And if I make an assumption that they're there to get divorced and that a good result from the mediation would be a separation agreement, then I sort of put myself in front of them instead of letting them lead the process. So most of the time, uh, that is what they want and that is where they're going and that is the role of the mediator to help them get there. But sometimes they have concluded that divorce is a necessary result because they have a problem they can't resolve. Mm -hmm. And when they have a problem they can't resolve and there are other options besides divorce that they would actually prefer then I think it's very helpful for us as mediators to be able to help them find that resolution and work toward it. How often have you had couples who actually decided they weren't going to get separated or divorced? Not that often. Uh, you know, I, I would say a handful of, of times over the years, I've worked with couples who reached a resolution that allowed them to stay married. And I think the reason for that is that by the time they come to my office, you know, a mediator's office or a lawyer's office, it's, it's too late and they've, the hurt is, is too big, the gap is too wide, and they really are continuing on, on the path. That doesn't mean that during the mediation process, their relationship could heal in some way, and they could, I have numerous stories that, you know, where people who 
came in screaming and yelling, really angry at each other, were able to reach a place where they could be conversational, they could be co-parents, they could enjoy each other's company as friends in a different transformed way, but um, even if they were not deciding to stay together. Well, what I think is really cool is that you, in your process of finding an alternative to litigation, which at that time uh, seemed like the only way to get divorced, you're finding ways that people can communicate with each other in the divorce process that open up all kinds of possibilities. And it seems like the limitation of litigation can be that it's focused on the divorce and less on the understanding. Well, it's kind of an interesting thing because I just want to be really clear that um, in New York, 97% of divorce cases settle before a judge makes a decision after a trial. And in the United States, it's 95%. So the chances of people settling not by, by a judge making a decision are, are pretty great. I think that what's different about the mediation process is that it encourages and facilitates and nurtures the, the, the communication between the couple. In my personal opinion, most relationships break down because of a failure of communication and that all the things that we think about as leading to divorce like infidelity or money problems or things like that are symptoms of a failure of communication or mm -hmm. breakdown of communication. Mm -hmm. So I think what's really interesting about the mediation process is it helps people communicate in a different way. And, and that helps them out of what I think of as a conflict trap where they get stuck in, yeah. a, in a conflict pattern that neither one of them knows how to get out of. And in mediation, they're able to have those conversations where they previously just end up getting stuck in a way that allows them to move through to a different place. It may not be the, the answer in a wonderful place, but it's a different place than the same old frustrating stuck place that they've always had before. And because of that, then they're able to move forward, again, in divorce, uh, coming apart, but to co-parent, uh, to communicate about the things that they're going to have to communicate in most cases in the future in a different way that feels more productive. And that's what's really cool about it, is that even though 97% of litigation cases may settle, there, that isn't necessarily the opportunity to build that communication. And what comes out on the other end is that, uh, particularly when there are children involved, though there may be a legally binding agreement, there may be a structure for parenting, the communication isn't there. And so the well being of the children isn't always foremost. Whereas in mediation or perhaps even in collaboration, since there's a higher, a collaborative divorce, there's a higher level of communication going on. There's more opportunity to have a parenting plan that people are behind emotionally. Yeah, I mean, the litigation process, even in settling in the litigation process, basically that the parties aren't doing the negotiating, their lawyers are doing it for them. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there could be people listening to this saying, well, that sounds great. I'd much rather give over the communication about Then talk this. to that jerk. That's right, and, and because we get stuck <laughs> and, we, and we, get, we just fight and it's frustrating and it's impossible. But here's the thing is you're not going to pay your lawyer for the rest of your co-parenting relationship to come in and, and talk on your behalf. And if you did, it would be. Yeah, really like expensive. about, you know, the kid's got to go to soccer, but it's my day. But how do we trade? And, you know, it costs you $600 an hour to do that. That's going to be a very expensive prospect. Exactly. Well, I mean, it's one thing to have that happen right now. I and mean, maybe it's a good idea to have your lawyers communicate right now when things are really aflame, in, inflamed and, and difficult. But, you know, five years from now, you're not going to do that. So. Um, the thing about so you, you hope right exactly. I mean, <laughs> hope. five years ago, in five years you could be doing that if you don't have the emotional basis for a really working relationship. Right. So this is exactly what I'm saying is that in the mediation process, people learn to talk to each other. They have the opportunity to learn to talk to each other in a different way that allows it to be more productive and less stuck, as opposed to having that the, the conversation just taken away from them and and their lawyers' conversations substituted. Uh, I'm curious, what do you think, since so many people do get divorced through litigation and through settling uh, and have perhaps a lower level of understanding or emotional basis for reaching agreement, what do you think are some ways that they could address that post-divorce? Well, I think it's always a good idea to get some help with that if you find... Um, yourselves really in a stuck spot, you know, either it was in coaching or in some kind of 
family counseling mm -hmm. that allows people to talk in a different way. And at the same time, you know, there you can change the the how. Like there, are, there's an app for that. You, you know, there's actually an app out there uh, that people can use to communicate about uh, schedules or money. Because sometimes there's a, and by sometimes I mean most of the time, there are, is an agreement between parties that you know, one person will pay 75 percent and another person will pay 25 percent of soccer. Use your example about soccer. So in, in the apps, and there's quite a so few football. to choose from, or football, whatever no, it is. No, football is your English. Okay. <laughs> we uh, have to honor the English. And, and some of these apps will even check your tone. You know, there'll be, there's a, some kind of algorithm in there that's a tone mm -hmm. checker so that you're not, you know, so one thing is to not talk about it and to text or email about mm -hmm. it, you know. Um, and another thing is to try something different. You know, I think that people get really stuck into the sense that I'm right and you're wrong. I'm right. If you just understood how right I am, you no, would I'm agree right. with me. <laughs> no, me. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> That's exactly what happens. And so if you were to try, you know, letting the other person be right about, you know, yeah. and, you know, or try experiment with something, because once you've come apart and now you're divorced, now that person doesn't hold you hostage, whether they intended to or, or not, in the same way. You have nothing to fear. They're angry. So what? It didn't work. Okay. You'll try something the next week and, and something different. And so I think that that idea of giving yourself permission to try a communication technique that's different mm -hmm. or allow them to, to be right for, a, a, you know, for once or, you know, just understand, uh, you know, reflect back to them with words, your understanding of what they're saying, what their concerns are. This can be really, really paradigm shifting. Mm -hmm. It seems like so much of the misunderstanding in the divorce process comes out in the realm of the financial. Uh, and there's this, sort of this tendency, you know, we have all these feelings and we don't have the opportunity to express them. That's why we're getting divorced, right? And so they come out, a lot of times that can come out uh, sort of in the concrete. And my understanding is that you are working on a program for people who are getting married so that there's more clarity about finances and less room for that kind of conflict should they get divorced or even if they stay together uh it might it might lay the the ground for what will happen when one person passes away uh, i'd love to hear more about your program well before i start talking about that i really want to talk about money and relationships a little bit and, and the way that money shows up as a reason to get divorced or, way, or sort of a power struggle in a, in a couple that ends up then getting divorced. And I think that most people who have money, and I mean like enough money, when people come in and money's the issue, it's really a substitute for something else because money is so much in our culture besides just a way to pay the bills. It, it's, a, it's a measure of power or success. It's a way that we compare ourselves to our neighbors our families of origin, our friends, and each other. Mm -hmm. And and so money is a really interesting thing because it usually means more than just money. And mm -hmm. it's really an interesting idea to kind of explore beneath that. And so sort of with that idea, you know, I've been a divorce lawyer for over 30 years. And, I've, and I do a lot of prenuptial agreements too, and have done over the years and I and I started thinking last year about how could you we set up a program uh, for people who are getting married that would support the marriage and allow them to come to some kind of agreement before they got married or early in the marriage that would support the relationship rather than feel like it often does when people when one person suggests a prenup like a cynical planning for the end of the marriage before it's even begun and so uh, we have this process that we call the romantic prenup mm -hmm. process. And it's romantic because it, it's not romantic in terms of hearts and flowers and chocolates and all of that sort of stuff, but it's romantic because it allows for people to minimize conflict in their relationship, pre-think through some of the things that cause conflict and build a strong lasting relationship that's beyond the honeymoon phase you know, that really is a deep, sustaining yeah an you know, but the statistics show that falling in love lasts on average between two or three years and so that sounds like something that's really important tell tell me more about tell us more about some of those things that you address in that process well there's really two things uh, one of them is money as you point out before so we ask each person to take a money assessment and it's really just to, you know to see whether or not 
how you address credit, how you address savings, how you feel about uh, carrying debt. You know, those are the, the kinds of things in which your attitudes are toward it. You know, sometimes we've had people come in and get get married and a week later find out that their spouse, you know, owes $150,000 in credit card debt. And this is, you, you know, and it, and it really threatens the relationship. Mm. And they're like, oh, I didn't know that. So it gives you the opportunity to kind of talk through what your attitudes are about that. And not just that, but uh, it's, you know, how you think about working and raising children, mm -hmm. you know, is, is a, you know, many times in my practice, my divorce practice, people will come in and one person will say, um, well, we agreed that one party would take some time off and while the children were young, but 20 years later, that person hasn't gone back to work. And that was never the deal. Like the other person says that, you know, that was never the deal. Or I've been unhappy that, you know, Sam hasn't worked for 15 years. I've been nagging them. We don't, and now I've got to split off my assets. So getting ahead of that you know, and talking about what your expectations are for each other during the marriage, I think is a really important thing. What are your attitudes towards money and, um, and so on and so forth. And another thing is, is uh, getting an assessment of your conflict type. So people have different ways of addressing conflict. And oftentimes there's a misunderstanding and miscommunication when someone just has a different style. And so people read, if you're not just like me, then you must be doing something wrong mm -hmm. or you must be having some kind of Yeah, because everybody sees everyone else through their own lens. Yes, exactly. And so we talk about conflict types so, and, and then talk through what that means for these people getting married and facing you know a long life together and many changes and raising a family maybe buying property creating a, a marital estate uh, what that will mean when they disagree how will they resolve conflict and so uh, through those two conversations along with the usual conversations about what happens when the marriage ends now let me just be clear that all marriages end either by death or divorce and oh uh, well yeah some people some people would argue with that but but I'm not one of them, actually. <laughs> yeah, well, as far as we know, all marriages end by death or divorce. And so you could have a 60-year marriage and be, you know, happily, you know, blissful that whole time. And that marriage will end. And, and I think that it's really important for people as they enter marriage to know what marriage means politically, to know mm -hmm. what it means legally and financially, what their obligations are under the law to each other once they walk down the aisle mm -hmm. and say, I do, and make a plan that in, that is a knowledgeable plan based on knowing what the, what the law is in their state, what the possibilities are, and if they want to change that, make sure that they have the opportunity to do that. I, I think you, I love the, the focus on what does it mean when a marriage ends by choice or through the passing of one partner in our society and on our world, and more importantly, from uh, the perspective of the children, you know, how can you minimize the conflict when that happens so that it's to the maximum benefit of everyone involved, so that the path is clearer and there's less there's less infighting, um, misunderstanding, and damage to everyone involved. Yeah, and I think what's really great about the romantic prenup process is when we're talking about conflict, we also talk about where are you going to go if you can't resolve conflict. You know, I don't mean like whether or not you're going to have Italian or Chinese for dinner. I mean serious conflict. Uh, can you know? Are you going to go to a coach? Are you going to go to a mediator? But it gives you a place to go. Marriage counselors always say to me, you know, marriage counseling is great, but most people go when you know, and they give it too little, too late. And, and so if they have a place where a couple has a place where they can go to talk about difficult things and have a facilitated conversation that really works for them, I think that's a tremendous opportunity for them. And then, of course, for their children, because we all know how bad conflict is for children, whether or not that's in a divorced family or an intact family. Well, conflict doesn't have to be bad for children. I mean, conflict is real life. It happens all the time. And if we equip our children with the tools that they need so that they understand what's happening and so that they can see the road through, then they can actually come out of a conflict, having that conflict be an asset in the long run, though it might be incredibly painful in the short run. And part of what I love about the, the, the romantic prenup is it sounds like there's actually some conversation there about the emotional ground and, uh, and, and where that relationship might go. So how might our listeners learn more about your program, find you, 
possibly even explore it with you if they're interested. Well, certainly they can go to our website, which is www.westchesterfamilylaw.com. And we'll have that in the notes, in the meeting notes. Yeah, or give us a call, 914-738-7765. We also have a 212 number, but I can't remember what it is. And we have offices in New York City and in Westchester County. We'd be happy to talk to anybody who's interested. And maybe one last question, would that be okay? Sure. What is the legacy that you want to leave behind as a professional? Well, I'm on a mission to change how people divorce and help them divorce with dignity. And I think that it is really important to focus on people when they're making transitions, whether or not they're transitions to getting married or transitions to getting divorced or transitions to widowhood or uh, whatever that is, to focus on their humanity and their priorities and their criteria for what a good life is mm -hmm. rather than what the law is. And the law is an opportunity or it's, it's an effort to be fair I think, but in the context is so broad that it ends up being unfair to many people. And so I think that uh, my, what I would hope would be to change the way we think about divorce, that it's not a shameful thing, it's something that happens and that we should focus on, on the humanity of the people going through it. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. Yeah, and I hope you come back soon. <laughs>